appreciate being here. We, um, we're gonna cover, I don't know how that happened, but there we go. Uh, we're gonna cover uh, post-installation care and cleaning and uh, justifying minimum standards. So the agenda is gonna be uh, pretty simple. Uh, why are there requirements for initial maintenance? Uh, who's responsible for those? Uh, what are the basic services needed for the different types of resilient? How to protect yourself as the flooring contractor? And then we'll wrap it up with questions. So uh, I say this at every presentation, and I think it's really important. Flooring is not designed, engineered, or manufactured to fail. We, the consumer, typically fail the flooring. And uh, I call it ramifications of specifications. And um, uh, it's something that I write a lot about. But uh, we are in charge of whether or not that flooring is going to fail or not. <clears throat> so as installers, you've installed the floor. Your work here is done, right? Looks good. Uh, everybody was happy. You covered it, and you're gone. But during through the construction process, is it really finished? So you've done the takeoff correctly. You've ordered the material. The material was received. You prepped the floor, you installed it per the specifications. Looks great. But the initial maintenance, it is part of the flooring process, believe it or not. Um, and I hear this all the time. I'm not responsible for the initial maintenance. It's not my contract. The manufacturers have said otherwise. All the specifications should be followed carefully. And in almost every resilient uh, spec, it says initial maintenance is required somewhere in that. So um, I will, throughout this presentation, I will refer back to the uh, uh, maintenance requirements an awful lot. The manufacturer specifications are there in writing to guide us. There are Sherpa, they will uh, tell us what we need to do. So the question is, well, you know, it wasn't in my contract, what's the worst that could happen? Well, on rubber, as an example of a resilient floor that's very popular right now, and, and it is really exploding across all types of segments, whether it's from healthcare to education to homeowners. Uh, uh, you know, you'll get uh, wax bloom, and that's uh, paraffin migration. Uh, uh, if you're in tile uh, material, you'll get mold release. Those will collect soil rapidly uh, it, it, through the initial process, and those need to be removed, uh, or that soil is going to damage the floor. Uh, in LVT, uh, initial maintenance should be removing all the dry, drywall dust out of the ticking or the uh, texture, uh, it, or paint that's inevitable, all the paint splatter. Uh, as that continues to dry and gets walked on, uh, it will be harder and harder to remove, and it will be an eyesore. Um, when we're talking about things like solid vinyl um, or you know vinyl enhanced uh, tile, uh, you'll get uh, inconsistencies in the uh, appearance until you do that initial maintenance and then drop down some finish on that. So those are just a few of the things that that can happen when initial maintenance isn't done. So, initial maintenance isn't just cleaning up the scraps, uh, sweeping, spot vacuuming, and adhesive cleanup. Yeah, that's, that's part of the process, but that's not completing the, uh, what the specification has in store for uh, the material. So my recommendation is this, whether you do it in-house or you subcontract that out, first and foremost, number one, uh, whoever is going to be doing or in charge of uh, doing the initial maintenance, have them sit in uh, the work progress uh, meetings. So this will allow uh, the maintenance person or the division to prepare the correct equipment, secure the correct chemistry, and have the right uh, trained uh, type of personnel on, on site when you say go. 
Uh, this will also, if you involve them early, this will also get them familiar with the site. Can't tell you how important this is. Um, where the water closets are, w the electricity, whether it's, it's uh, fully intact or if they have to bring 300 feet of extension cord. Um, and then also access to the building. You know, can they get, typically maintenance people work in the evenings. They don't work in that first shift. Uh, now, they certainly can come and, and do it if, if the site is prepared, but there's that fourth thing and that is other trades in the building. Uh, you certainly don't want somebody working overhead while your maintenance people are trying to clean the floor. Never works out. So first and foremost, make sure that they're involved in the uh, schedule process. Uh, two, whoever's doing that process, make sure that they're well-trained. Um, there's all types of floor, resilient flooring and those resilient floors all have certain subtleties and we'll cover that here in a minute. So make sure that they're, they're well-versed in what they're going to be doing. Um, it's always, uh, I sit on uh, the IICRC uh, board. Uh, I sit on the uh, RFMT, the Resilient Floor Man, uh, Maintenance Technician, along with the carpet Commercial Carpet Maintenance Technician. So there's all types of certifications and training programs out there so that the technicians are well-versed in, in those materials. And uh, the last part of number two is make sure that uh, the chemistry is uh, proper. You don't want to use high pH cleaners uh, on rubbers and linoleum. That's just one example. Uh, same way with uh, using an acid uh, or acidic product to clean a marble. You don't want to do those things. So make sure that they understand uh, what they're cleaning. And the third thing is make sure that they have the proper equipment and supplies. Now, it's not a lot, but uh, we're going to get into this, making sure that the manufacturer's recommendations are followed. Um, a lot of equipment crosses over. Rotary floor machine is used on practically everything. Uh, chemical supplier, very important to make sure that, you know, when you get uh, to the timeline of having the uh, service uh, done, make sure that your supplier has got that chemistry uh, in stock and ready to go. So now I'm going to do just a brief overview of the materials and procedures of what it takes to do uh, resilient floor maintenance. Equipment and uh, uh, chemistry needed. So standard rotary floor machine. I'm sure everybody on this call has got a, a sander or a rotary floor machine, a swing machine, a 175. It's called by a lot of different things, but a standard rotary floor machine. You're going to need a proper uh, chemistry, and we'll talk about that in the uh, uh, maintenance spec. Typically, clean mops and buckets. Uh, that's uh, really uh, important to use. And then we're going to also use uh, uh, pads and uh, drivers. Uh, wet vacs uh, always speed up the process, uh, along with uh, fans. If you're applying finish, microfiber flat mops are are, are the thing of, of today. Uh, don't use string mops anymore. A lot of waste in that and not a great coverage. And then most importantly, make sure that your crew has all the safety placards. We do wet work. So in wet work, we have to make sure that we're safe in doing the process and keeping everybody around you safe. So make sure that all the safety uh, placards and uh, uh, procedures are followed. So, initial maintenance and vinyl. And the vinyls are heterogeneous sheet, homogeneous sheet, luxury vinyl tile, that's LVT and LVP, uh, solid vinyl, uh, vinyl enhanced tile, VET and VCT. These are simple processes. First, uh, almost all the manufacturers request a neutral pH cleaner. That's something in that range of six and a half pH to eight. 8 pH. Um, 7 is neutral, so 6 to 8, somewhere in there, that's a neutral cleaner. Your equipment, it's that rotary floor machine, typically with a red pad. Some may, some may require a little bit uh, steeper, like a green pad, and th these colors are based off of the 3M 
uh, pad system, everybody has kind of uh, uh, included in their process. And then uh, doing the work, simple. Correct dilution of chemistry. You apply it down and you let it dwell for the proper time according to the uh, manufacturer's recommendation of that chemistry. Once uh, the dwell time is complete, we agitate it with the proper pad. That could be, like I said, that red or green. We remove that slurry. We rinse thoroughly with fresh, clean water, allow it to dry. And then if it requires a finish, then we're going to apply the um, recommended finish. Uh, and that could be a private label by that manufacturer or an, uh, or an equal, or it could be one of four or five recommended uh, finishes that um, the manufacturer has listed in their maintenance specification. For initial maintenance on rubber, and those, those uh, products include uh, heterogeneous sheet vinyl or sheet rubber, homogeneous sheet, uh, rubber tile, homogeneous solid, or the uh, heterogeneous uh, rubber tile, and uh, the ever popular bonded crumb uh, or rubber crumb. And those materials are really uh, gaining a lot of popularity. And um, uh, we see them a lot in the, um, uh, not just in the athletic facility anymore, but also moved to the corporate facility. So the chemistry, once again, these are general statements, but typically it's either a neutral cleaner or an all purpose cleaner. Uh, the equipment is typically a rotary floor machine again, but we, we, we um, usually see that we switch from a, a red pad, a, a flat surface, to a soft brush. And those brushes have equivalency to pads. The reason we do that is that typically on rubber, you either have a texture like a raised rubber disc or a square, or you have a texture like a golf ball or a hammered finish. Uh, so that brush gets down into those uh, textures or rides up so around the texture. So we want to make sure that we do follow that pretty closely. Bill, I've got a question for you. What, what sort of uh, visual effect do you get if you use a pH neutral, uh, the wrong pH cleaner? So um, if, you use an, if you use an improper uh, chemical, uh, such as a high pH on a rubber, uh, you will start uh, to see a yellowing. Uh, it could also, um, I don't want to use the term bleach because uh, rubber, uh, you won't bleach the rubber, but you will get significant color changes to that surface. Um, over time, uh, use of the uh, higher pH will dry out that finish. It will also pull uh, the uh, uh, paraffins uh, or, I'm going pretty deep here, but rubber has a lot of different types of uh, uh, recipes that they built. Some will use a high paraffin content. Some will use um, a clay content or different oils. So a higher pH chemistry will draw those up and um, uh, that will uh, speed up the, um, uh, the, the uh, aging process. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. So uh, uh, we apply that uh, properly diluted solution. Again, we allow it to dwell. We agitate it. Agitation is really important. Uh, then we remove that slurry. We rinse thoroughly. And, and the job isn't ton, done, excuse me, the job isn't done uh, properly until the floor is dry and ready to receive uh, traffic. So very important there. Another uh, resilient flooring is linoleum. Once again, this has become extremely popular uh, through the, uh, the green movement. Um, uh, and so you have either linoleum sheet or linoleum tile. Now the chemistry is, is, is still pretty much a neutral cleaner. There are manufacturers out there that sometimes use the term all-purpose cleaner. So I have added that to, the, uh, 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 to this slide. Uh, but we want to keep it as neutral as possible. Uh, the equipment is rotary floor machine 
Once again, typically with that red pad that doesn't have a lot of uh, mineral to it and it's just a, a, uh, a pad for a, a nice light scrub. The process is um, pretty much the same. Uh, apply the sol solution. It's important to know that linoleum is uh, moisture sensitive. Uh, it is a natural product and it will absorb some moisture. So we don't want to flood the floor. Use your solution properly. Allow it to dwell the proper uh, dwell time according to the manufacturer's instructions. We're going to agitate that floor, get it good and clean. Uh, extract the slurry, rinse it thoroughly with good clean water and dry it completely. Um, I don't know of any linoleum floors that require a, um, a secondary uh, application of, of floor finish of acrylic product after initial maintenance. Some say if uh, desired, you can apply a finish, but uh, typically they don't ask for that. So you're saying that linoleum flooring, once it's installed, the initial maintenance floor falls to the floor covering installer? They all do, yes. Okay. Very good. And then some of the more unique uh, resilient flooring, like cork or uh, electrostatic dissipative flooring, um, you see right there, big and bold, refer to man flooring manufacturer's uh, recommend uh, recommendation. And with cork, especially with cork, even though it comes and uh, probably 50% of the cork manufacturers out there have a factory coated polyurethane coating to it, uh, they're still edges. So you want to make sure that if you do uh, initial maintenance on a cork floor that does not require secondary urethane coating applied to it, that you use minimum uh, solution. Uh, for this application because uh, it will swell up, it'll start to peak and curl and um, not, not a good situation. So uh, the chemistry, always uh, follow the manufacturer's recommendation, whether it's in cork or uh, ESD, because you may have very unique uh, uh, materials that are carbon sensitive on the ESD. Uh, so we're gonna apply those uh, specified chemistries down let it dwell again. So important to let the chemistry dwell. Um, uh, we never just uh, put soap on our hands and then rinse it off. We put soap on our hands, we agitate it, let it go to the scrub, and then we rinse. Same process with the floor. Let that chemistry do the work, allow agitation to, uh, to remove all that uh, stuck soil. So we're going to uh, extract the slurry, rinse thoroughly, uh, allow it to dry completely. And then in the case of ESD floors, some do require a uh, special finish that is applied uh, secondarily. And um, uh, there, there aren't very many manufacturers to do it because of the uh, raw material cost of that uh, uh, polymer with a carbon fiber uh, uh, component to it is pretty expensive. So uh, usually those manufacturers will uh, brand it themselves, uh, but there are a couple uh, uh, manufacturers that uh, generically do it as well. So sorry, I was stumbling for a word there. So the question always is, once you do these procedures, was it done right? That's what everybody always asks. Was it done right? Well, this is how you can protect yourself. And I call it the one, two, three. Uh, one, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. They spend a lot of effort trying to uh, put down in writing. They have great technical support. I know you've got uh, folks on your uh, uh, committee, like uh, Don Steika and, and others that work very hard to create uh, easy to understand, easy to follow manufacturer's recommendations for maintenance. So by all means, first, and foremost, follow those manufacturers' uh, recommendations. But on a side note, contact the technical support for the most up-to-date specifications. Uh, probably everybody on this call has a website, and you know how difficult it is to get that website constantly updated with the most current information. So cover your base. Email technical support. Say, please send me the technical information or the maintenance procedures for XYZ. 
And you could have three or four different uh, processes because you may have three or four different materials on that job site. Uh, two, always realize that your liability can increase when you just kind of take those recommendations, throw it over the side, um, or the, quite often, they're used for um, uh, uh, dust pans. Uh, you know, they ship those uh, installation and maintenance instructions, I think with every box, quite often they're used for dust pans. Uh, make sure that your uh, team is utilizing those. And three, most importantly, I think for many things, is document things. It's easy to do. So you document the process, what your team, what you, you hired it out or your in-house in staff, what they did. Take pictures. Everybody's got a cell phone. So take pictures of what you did and uh, then sign off. Now, Sometimes uh, job site supervisors don't want to sign anything. Um, and it may be a simple, hey, do you agree that, that this floor is in good working order, good condition when we left? I will agree to that. Have them sign off on it. That is a 20 minute presentation in about 19 minutes, I think. But uh, I'm certainly, I'm open to any questions that you guys might have.